Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. I hope you're doing well. Are your photos starting to look the same? Do you wish you had a wow reaction rather than a that's nice reaction? In this video, I'm gonna teach you five pro tips that you can put into use today to take photos that stand out of the crowd. If you stay till the end, I'll teach you the secrets to get shots like this, this, and this that all have something in common. Could you spot what it was? My name is Simo Daltrema and I'm a professional wildlife and nature photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes in nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. Tip number one is to use wind direction to your advantage. Wind direction is critical for photographing birds and mammals, but for different reasons. First off, large birds, like airplanes, need to take off and land into the wind. If you see a large bird on the ground or in the water, position yourself upwind. That way, if they take off, they'll take off towards you. This is important because you want to be taking photos of the front of your wildlife, not the back of them. This shot right here was taken using this technique where I positioned myself upwind and the bird took off towards me. Secondly, if more birds come and join the first ones, which is not uncommon for flocking birds like geese, ducks, finches, they will land towards you again, giving you an opportunity to get better shots. Here's some shots I took of birds landing when they were joining other birds. Thirdly, in open water, birds bob facing into the wind. Again, you wanna be taking the photos of the fronts of birds, so have the wind at your back and birds in water will be bobbing in your direction, giving you an opportunity for photos like this. What about mammals? Do we use the same technique? Actually, just the opposite. Most mammals have a keen sense of smell, and if you're upwind, they will smell you or they will hear you because your sound travels much more with the direction of the wind. You wanna be downwind or sidewind from mammals so they can't hear you or smell you. So for mammals like foxes and deer, you wanna be sidewind or downwind so your scent won't alarm them. Even if they see you, if they don't smell you, sometimes they won't be alarmed. This was the case in this photo where the fox could see me but not smell me and wasn't alarmed at my presence. So in summary, for birds, put the wind at your back. For mammals, put the wind in your face. My tip number two is not to ignore the common stuff. There may be birds that you see so commonly you consider them to be junk birds or some mammals that you consider pests in your neighborhood. Rather than looking at them as pests, consider making masterpieces out of them. Number one, you get to practice your techniques on the most common species, which means you get lots of practice. Number two, you can make beautiful photos out of the most common species in your neighborhood. That doesn't diminish the quality of your photo. Here are some of the most common species in my neighborhood. I made a commitment that if I can't find uncommon species, I'm gonna take uncommon photos of the common ones. Song sparrows are everywhere in my neighborhood, but if you find great light and an interesting composition, you can still take a great photo. Red-winged blackbirds are the top five most common species in North America with between 300 million and 400 million birds. But that doesn't mean that when I catch a photograph of its breath, it doesn't make a beautiful photo. Porcupines are considered pests where I live. Dogs are often getting into entanglements with them and cars hit them on the road in the middle of the night. But that doesn't mean I can't get a great photo of one like I did with this mother and juvenile. So for all the tips I'm gonna give you in this video, go practice them on the common species. That way, when something more exotic shows up, you'll have practiced your techniques and you'll have them down. That was the case for me for this redhead, which is a rare duck where I live. But in my very first encounter, I was able to get this photo, which I'd practiced before on more common species like this ridneck duck. So now we can't use that excuse anymore that we don't have any exotic species where we live. Tip number three is to get photos that imply emotion out of your wildlife subjects. Now, wildlife doesn't really have emotions and facial expressions like we do, but they can make some funny gestures and funny faces that look like anger, surprise, silliness, and you need to capture those and show them off in your photos. So this is actually a trick, but by taking tons of photos, you can get all kinds of funny faces and expressions out of your wildlife which implies some kind of emotion that add a lot to your photo. I take between 1,000 and 2,000 shots in one morning of photography. Then when I go home and go through my photos, I call them for interesting looks, not sharpness. I did that for years, going through my photos looking for the sharpest ones. But now I go through looking for the ones that look like they're telling a story and have some kind of emotion in them. One technique is to only show part of your subject in the photo. It implies a bit of mystery. Like in this photo of a great horned owl. So how will you know when you've taken a photo that looks like your subject is displaying some kind of emotion? 
It'll most often happen when it looks like your animal subject is saying or thinking something, like it looks like it needs a caption at the bottom. For example, this wood duck looks like it's thinking something. And of course the snow adds to the story here. What would the wood duck be saying? Let me know in the comments below how you would caption this photo. Here's another one where a Canada goose gosling is trying to catch some corn thrown by some children. This just looks plain silly, but it makes a great photo. This herring gull gave me a quirky look while I was walking by, which I thought made a great photo. So the trick here is stay with your subject and take tons of photos. Keep shooting while you've got the subject in front of you. And when you get home, don't cull them for sharpness, cull them for the best stories and the best expressions. Tip number four is to find the best light and the worst light. Now, what do I mean by that? It's that medium light gives you medium photos. My best photos are taken in the first and last hour of the day when there's the best light, beautiful sun, beautiful golden halos around everything, or the very worst weather. These opposing conditions of beautiful light and terrible weather will make your photos stand out in the crowd. Full midday sun and cloudy weather will generally make the most boring photos. It's always possible to get a great photo in those conditions, but it's much, much harder. Early morning sun for the first hour and a sunlit end of the day and the last hour of the day are the best beautiful light for photos. Beautiful oranges, low contrast, lots of color. Two thirds of my top tier photos were taken in these conditions. And that's also when the wildlife is the most active. When people send me their photos for critique, one of the most common problems I see, it's shot in very poor light or in full midday sun. Here's a few of my photos taken in the first hour of the day when there's beautiful orange sun, beautiful light. And here's a few photos of mine taken in the last few hours of the day when you have beautiful sunsets. At the other end of the spectrum is bad weather. Wind, rain, snow, fog, these add a beautiful element to your photo and they add something in the photo beyond just having your subject in the photo. These weather elements when added to your photos helps explain the environment in which your subject lives and how they survive. It helps tell a story about your subject in your photo. Here are some photos I've taken in the snow. I find the snow adds a beautiful environment to my photo. Also here are some photos taken in the wind. I love how the wind ruffles the feathers of birds for example. And here are photos taken in the rain showing the real environment in which our subject lives on a daily basis. So when it's given bad weather, get dressed for it and get out there and take some photos. Don't forget to cover your gear with a rain cover for when it's raining. Tip number five is around making sure your camera's always ready to get that shot. As we saw earlier, taking tons of photos while your subject is in sight and going through them later and looking for those magic moments is a great strategy. Most cameras can't shoot continuously for more than a few seconds. The problem is if you try to take too many photos, they can't write to the card fast enough and your camera starts to stutter. It needs to slow down how many photos it's taking because it can't write them to the card fast enough. When that happens, your camera starts to sound like this. Where your camera starts to slow down and in some models, downright freezes. This is really bad if you're right in the middle of your best action. So what can you do about this? First off, get the fastest cards you can for your camera. That way your camera can take more photos before it starts to stutter. Note that the numbers advertised on the front of the card are often the read speed. That is how fast it can be read from the card to your computer. That's actually not the critical piece of information. You want cards with a fast write speed. That is that your camera can write the information about your photos to the cards as quickly as possible. Secondly, shoot in bursts when the peak action happens like this. Most cameras can shoot quite a while when you give it little breaks for it to write information to the cards. Shooting herons flipping food before swallowing it is a great example. During the flips is a great time to be taking a burst of photos because it's interesting and makes some great photos. In between the flips, you don't want to be taking photos because for that final flip, when it swallows the fish, you don't want to have run out of buffer. You want to make sure you've got some photos left to take. Another time you want to use this is when an action sequence might last a long time, like seven or eight or nine or 10 seconds. You want to be shooting the burst to make sure you can get to the end in case something really interesting happens there. And I said I'd give you an extra tip and that's to look for backlit and sidelit situations, which makes amazingly beautiful photos. The contrast between the subject being a bit backlit and dark combined with the bright edges of side light or rim light make a beautiful magical effect. But there's some winning conditions you need to be able to get this type of shot. Number one, you need direct light on your subject, preferably from a low angle. Secondly, you want as clean a background as you can so that the highlights on the edges really stand out against the background. Thirdly, you also want your background to be dark. The highlight will not stand out against a bright background. And finally, this works better on subjects that are fluffy or furry. That's because the depth of the fur or the feathers makes a much more prominent rim light around the subject. 
And by the way, this works for backlit breath as well, like in this photo. So when you see a subject fluffy or furry, don't be afraid to position yourself so that the sun is behind them. Get a dark background, a clean background if you can, really get those highlights showing up. If you like these tips, please give me a like, that way YouTube will show them to other people as well. Go out there and take some amazing photos.